In 2007, video game developer United Front Games was formed, mostly consisting of ex-EA Black Box, Rockstar Vancouver, Radical Entertainment and Volition employees. And one of the first publishers they got in contact with was Activision, who wanted to re-explore the open world genre after brief success with the true crime series, and tasked this new Vancouver developer to make a concept. By this point, The Departed, an undercover cop crime thriller and remake of Hong Kong's Infernal Affairs had just won the Academy Award for Best Picture, Assassin's Creed which focused on parkour gameplay became the new popular IP, and outside of media UFC was rising in popularity as well. So United Front developers decided to make a new IP based on all those aspects. An undercover story with melee mechanics a high focus and set in a contemporary Hong Kong called Black Lotus. However, when heads of Activision noticed the striking similarities to the True Crime series, in 2009 they ordered United Front Games to turn it into True Crime Hong Kong, which the developers were initially skeptical about. They believed that franchise had passed its prime, wanted to move on from the flash noises and fast cameras into something more serious, and felt the only similarity between their game and the True Crime titles was that the main protagonist was a cop. But I suppose from Activision's point of view, a sequel to a recognisable franchise from the previous generation would improve its chances commercially. However, on February 2011, after multiple delays and increased budget, Activision cancelled the entire game, claiming that after all that work, Rockstar in the meantime had completely rewritten the open world genre with Grand Theft Auto 4 and Red Dead Redemption, and thought that their game wasn't going to cut it. Though looking at true crime New York City, that's a big claim to make. And although producer Dan Sochin said that United Front understood the decision, they also said the game was virtually ready, and were disappointed to see three years of research, heart and soul poured into this project just vanish. Fortunately it didn't, because a story almost resembling the development of Red Dead Revolver, another publisher wanted to bring it back to life. A couple of weeks after cancellation, United Front discovered that members of Square Enix were trying out their true crime Hong Kong game and wanted to talk to them in regards to whether they can work together or not. And from that point, the stars aligned, with both parties having a full understanding how an open world is meant to flow to be solid. With goodwill and feedback from a new established publisher, the developers were re-energized and continued unfinished business. And on August 2012, after Square Enix confirmed they were the new publishers, Sleeping Dogs was finally released for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3 and PC on August 2012, and will get a definitive edition for the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 on October 2014. Can anyone name any games from the 7th generation that haven't been remastered? Like most open world titles, I have to admit it took me half a decade to even know the existence of Sleeping Dogs, because I was that hooked to Rockstar's previously mentioned titles. Since it was originally meant to be a true crime title, I or let me rephrase, you ladies and gentlemen wanted me to review those first. I reviewed Streets of LA back in July after it became the most voted Patreon suggestion, and I initially planned to go straight to Sleeping Dogs since that became Patreon's most voted suggestion right after that. Thank you, Otaku Angel. Do they have internet in America? <laughs> I think they're getting it next year. However, after I said that, I got a lot of comments telling me I should review True Crime New York City beforehand. So, I did. Yeah, okay. See, now it wasn't that easy. Although I didn't really like the game, looking at the view count, you guys made the right call. But now that they're out of the way, finally, I put it to you now, the review of Sleeping Dogs. <laughs> Yeah, you got the money? Criminal Wei Shen is overseeing a drug deal that goes completely wrong, and despite his best efforts to escape, is arrested by the police. You must be a very dangerous man, Wei Shen. That is exactly what we want people to think. But in actuality, Wei is an undercover officer, and the arrest was a ploy to help him infiltrate a triad gang called the Son On Yi. He meets up with old friend Jackie Ma, who works for Winston, the red pole of the Water Street gang, currently in conflict with the J gang. You make sure people understand that I'm in control, not dog eyes. Wei Shen throughout this time impresses Winston with his skill and dependence without suspecting anything. But all that continued in fighting between two factions working for the same gang. Sun On Yi and Dragon Head, Uncle Po eventually intervenes, with Wei later becoming a fully initiated member. However, with Uncle Po's struggling health, what follows is all the Red Poles fighting over who gets to be the future Dragon Head, and Wei Shen struggling to cope with being on both sides as an undercover we both appear to have the same problem, Wei Shen. 
and the opportunity to benefit if we work together. So it seems. It might sound like this explanation doesn't do it enough justice, but there's a lot I don't want to spoil since it's an extremely well-written video game. Well, you took a chance on me, Winston. I wanted to make sure it paid off. You got the right attitude. I take back what I said in my True Crime New York City review when I said Sleeping Dogs was a spiritual successor. Okay, you're a policeman not wearing uniform in a giant city with martial art moves and a lot of recognizable celebrity talent voicing the characters. But in Sleeping Dogs, it's a lot more than that. You're a cop. I'm an undercover cop. The rules are different. You are an officer of the law, Wayne. Same as me. We are not the same. What this game tries to do is go the extra mile, illustrate the feelings and pressures of being undercover. It's not like Wei Shen is investigating faceless enemies. He legit connects with them, especially Jackie Ma. Sometimes you gotta just take it. Totally, man. It's time to take a little initiative. He begins to understand why they're what they are, questioning whether he can uphold the law, questioning the police's intentions. You think HKPD puts a lot of effort into solving dead gangsters? Well, so what, they're not people now? It's almost like you're playing through the story like you're not undercover, yet it's always in the back of your mind, so there's always a sense of danger hanging out with the triads, at least for the first couple of hours of gameplay. And when something truly violent happens, oh boy, it's like having a long needle close to your eye. It's not overly gory, it's the way it hints it off screen and sound cues. I grew up with these guys. I know who they are, what they are. All the intel reports in the world won't give you that. Another key part is the fact that Wei Shane was born in Hong Kong before moving to America as a child. Child. Now that he's back, he has to relearn the culture. Winston is initially skeptical because of his American background. Wei never speaks the Cantonese language throughout the story. He doesn't fully understand it. There's a conversation during one mission that sums it all up. Growing up in old prosperity, she she started down a particular road and couldn't get off of it. My mother hoped that moving to San Francisco would shake her up. Once you realize these little details after researching the game Mendora's second playthrough, it makes the story so much better. Basically, it would be a very different narrative if the main protagonist was born and raised in Hong Kong. Research is a very important part of any form of media and makes the job easier once things click. Hong Kong kind of feels like home. And United Front went all out to recreate Hong Kong for this game. Throughout development, game designers visited Hong Kong a few times and met up with police who specialize in triad activity, former undercover agents, and members of the triad, former and current, to understand their motivations and influence over the region. The latter certainly wouldn't have been easy, but there's no question the information they got from everybody would have been invaluable. And a lot of what they talk about is in this game. They did a fantastic job in that regard. It's crazy the lengths they went to research for this game, and it's almost as fun to read as playing the game itself. This can be rough business, but one thing we got going for us is each other. Brothers, you know. I know people use that word a lot, but it means something to me, and it should to you too. On top of that, it flourishes on the map. When driving across the highways, streets, walking through the markets, the signs and billboards have more neon colors than the Color Shed logo. The Cantonese language was proofread to be correct. It's used at least 70% of the time by pedestrians, and a lot of the actors are from, and was recorded in Hong Kong. <laughs> Unfortunately, graphically from a technical perspective, it's surprisingly underwhelming by 7th generation standards. The draw distance is poor, like there are moments that appear as though the game hasn't fully loaded the textures. And going back to the story, character models and animations even during cutscenes feel closer to a 6th gen title. It also affects gameplay too, like the way Wei runs, he's like a Ken doll. Keep in mind we're looking at the original game, I assume the definitive edition has improved some of these issues. And even with all that said, after my recent experience with True Crime New York City, this is a massive breath of fresh air in comparison. Nah, fortunately none of these issues ruin my overall enjoyment, especially for the reasons I mentioned before with all the research put into this game. Don't take on a boss in your own triad, unless you know for a fact someone else is gonna back you up. Hierarchy is the only thing anyone cares about. Always have, always will. <laughs> 
Thanks for the advice, old timer. Anyway, geographically, there's no Victoria Harbour connecting both sides of Hong Kong Island and Kowloon Peninsula, nor are there any mountains in the distance. In Sleeping Dogs, the middle of the map feels like I'm entering Hong Kong. The skyscrapers surrounding give the illusion of being in certain parts of Hong Kong if you weren't paying attention to the map. There are parts that look like they're accessible, they're not, like this part of the map for example. But it's better that way simply because it's gameplay focused like an open world map should. For example, even the alleyways are common shortcuts, like the GP will take you along those routes which makes navigating feel more like an arcade racing game and finding something else to do without taking over 10 minutes just to reach your intended destination. There are also taxis to reach spots instantly but I wouldn't recommend them because it's almost impossible to hop in one of these without accidentally stealing it. It happened more times than it should have. If we don't catch that van you won't have your special cake at your wedding. What? Now that I think about it, driving in general is the one thing I wish the developers could have fixed. Well, not the mechanics, I don't know if it's that or the way the camera is positioned while driving. When braking it feels like they don't work at all for the first couple of seconds and then it stops in a snap. The camera stays perfectly aligned with the car when cornering like I might as well use the d-pad for steering, making it harder to see oncoming traffic on intersections. I know it's a trivial thing to point out, but imagine how much better it would be if the camera moved smoothly like GTA 5. It's strange I'm saying this because as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of the developers from United Front Games also worked previously for EA Black Box who made the Need for Speed titles in the noughties. I wouldn't have needed to criticize the driving mechanics, unless they worked on Undercover or Pro Street, then it would make more sense. Okay, that was pretty harsh. Eventually, by the time you reach around three quarters into the story, you'll be pushing the map to its limits, flying through the roads and city centers of Hong Kong full throttle. And another thing that's satisfying to do is bash enemies burnout style. However, even that is flawed because thanks to the size of the map, out of instinct I always found myself driving on the same roads every time I got into chase to avoid using the brakes, trying desperately to escape what I suspect is enemy rubber banding during these chases. The only way to shake him is to bash them enough times, but if they hit something else, it barely hurts them. Like the game always forces you to be in this situation. I just think you should be rewarded for being efficient, much like the rest of the game. I think you lost them. Speaking of enemy chases, this game is a lot more fun when you're the one doing the chasing on foot. It isn't just roads and alleyways, but the map also has rooftops, balconies, and sometimes indoor buildings planned just for scripted chases. But what is interesting about these balcony and rooftop sprints is that it's a hybrid of platformer and quick time events. You can only perform actions on command when they appear on the screen. If you miss time it, it takes way a second longer to get back on track, and the more you miss time it during your chase, the more likely you'll lose the enemy and fail. It's weird, you hold the sprint button while running and let go for a millisecond to perform an action. It took me by surprise on the very first mission, running through the buildings inside, through tables, fences, and climbing and jumping off fish tanks and shit without warning. It's meant to give the same sense that you're a Jackie Chan or Jet Li. Suddenly in a situation where it seems impossible taking out all those bad guys single-handedly, just like a lot of Hong Kong action movies, it's about taking advantage of what's available in your surroundings. I fell in love with the melee controls. There's so much you can do, yet it feels so simple to comprehend. You can attack with varying levels of power, defend, counter, and best of all, drag enemies into walls and objects. Jeez, I forgot how vicious some of these can be. I was worried it would make it too easy since it knocks out whatever enemy you throw instantly, but by the time you reach the second half, enemies gradually become harder to tame. They take more damage, carry more melee weapons, and are more likely to counter and block your attacks, encouraging you to try different ones until they relent. Not to mention how quickly your health bar goes down, so you really want to use that bathroom sink. <laughs> But again, it's not a button masher, nor is it as complicated as a traditional fighting game. And eventually, by the time you learn new moves from a kung fu master as you find jade statues all over the map during the missions, trust me, they are worth learning. It's easy to feel like you're in the zone. Oh, 
<laughs> Seriously, that's the best you can do. That sort of approach also affects the shooting aspect too. During shootouts, sometimes you have to disarm enemies, take their weapon before you can use it, you can jump out of cover into slow motion, and whenever you're free roaming, only small weapons can be concealed with barely any ammo. Aside from those things, there isn't anything that hasn't been said, other than it simply controls better than both true crime titles. But you can tell the melee aspect was a bigger priority, and rightfully so. Although it took me longer to get through the tutorial than it should have, and when it's said that guns are rare in Hong Kong, I'm sure you've noticed that guns are something of a rarity in Hong Kong. I don't believe that for a second. Even though you play as an undercover cop, despite what Raymond thinks, it almost feels like there's no limit to the action on screen. Though according to producer Jeff Jeff O'Connell, using guns is a symbol of an upcoming gang war in Hong Kong, whereas I see it as a good excuse to keep the melee sections rolling in. Every time you complete a mission, you get experience points based on your approach. These help level up Wei Sheng and unlock new skills, moves, improve damage, etc. The way it structures itself reminds me of the 2016 reboots of Doom and Ratchet and Clank. I assume it was meant to provide the replay value of approaching missions differently. Like when the game was originally called True Crime Hong Kong, it might have had the same good cop, bad cop system from the predecessors. But after trying my best to be the good cop, it is possible to get the max points on both ends. Basically being aggressive and careful at the same time. Not a bad thing, just don't expect a completely different experience replaying it like a GTA lunatic since there are no alternate endings. <laughs> And when you're free roaming, finding other things to do like dating women, offering help, street racing, gambling, karaoke. Where do I remember that? You fought the law and the law won. Anyway, completing all these give you face experience points, which also unlock skills and perks, and the option to purchase additional outfits and vehicles. Supposedly this part is inspired by The Godfather, where Wei roams the streets and nobody knows him, but by the end everyone is acknowledging him as a Don and giving him respect and offering him free food and permission to wear clothes to suit the levels of recognition. No pun intended. These are the latest. Perfect for you. Although talking about purchasing vehicles, being so used to other open world games, not being allowed to take vehicles and store them in parking garages annoyed me at first, especially when looking at the prices. Must be because you're a cop and you're supposed to stay good to some degree. At least all the car parks across the map have the vehicles always ready for you fully fixed, including a valet. Sorry, I, I don't have any time. Sometimes. <laughs> What I like is, despite how story driven this game is, it's also highly interactive. Because you're an undercover cop, there are moments when you use some of that police tech. It's an acquired taste, these parts, but I like them. They remind me of GTA Chinatown Wars. And for one of these bits of tech, on the map you'll find drug busts where you clear enemies, find the nearest camera in the area, hack it so you can access it from your safe house, and use it to watch over any drug dealing activity. The Sutsman has been slaughtered! Funny how you can hack all the cameras before looking at activity. Suddenly, all the dealers are doing their business the same time Wei Shen is watching from his safe house. We got them. I wish there was more challenge to these parts like their actions and body language, not just a marker that points straight at the target after a few seconds. And also, it's probably just me, but there's one camera where every time I try to arrest the guy, it just freezes the whole game. And I'm playing a digital copy, so I definitely can't blame it on a scratched disc. That said, the fact you're an undercover cop means you're doing a combination of cop and crook related activities and missions. There aren't that many video games that let you do that, at least not as well rounded as Sleeping Dogs, and story wise it's all plausible. Therefore the variety is surprisingly high, and I'll happily do some of these things en route to the main missions.
and the way the missions are set up, you'll do everything at least once throughout the story, you explore almost the entire map on so many elevations, and everything improves Wei Shen's stats. And that's the difference between Sleeping Dogs and the true crime titles for example. New York City has more to do with additional moves and weapons, the game was easy enough that it wasn't necessary. With Sleeping Dogs, I imagine that it's possible to complete this game without the health upgrades and additional moves and perks, but the difficulty curve slowly increases to the point where it encourages you to do these things without necessarily forcing you. It provides good enough control on all aspects of gameplay to get a superb mix of different things to do, all the while not feeling too tedious in the process, especially on foot. Oh, and let's not forget the superbly written narrative that keeps getting better and better right up to the climax. <laughs> I killed your friend. Very bad. You'll get to see him soon. <laughs> Seriously, I didn't expect Sleeping Dogs to be this good. I like that it takes a lot of the positives from the GTA series, but in almost every way it adds enough of its own spin, like being in a different country and kung fu fighting mechanics, to be a unique experience. Not as high quality with the more robotic animations, blurry graphics, there are signs of development hell when playing it. But that's what happens when you're initially with Activision and don't have a Call of Duty budget. You've got to work with what you've got, and it's more than salvaged by how solid the overall experience is. It does so many things right, you wonder why Activision gave up on it in 2011. Though it's debatable whether it would have been as good if it remained as a true crime title, since a lot of the new and retooled features were the result of consulting by Square Enix when they became the new publishers. And if you look at the commercial perspective of Sleeping Dogs, Activision were probably right. Because of the hype surrounding Grand Theft Auto V a year before the release date, keep in mind we were expecting for it to come out in March at that time, I admit that's all I thought about. Therefore, Sleeping Dogs didn't have a chance. Selling 1.5 million copies a month after release. Better than True Crime New York City, but was labelled a commercial failure by Square in 2013, and along with other disappointments around that time, caused Square to take a huge loss that financial year. Despite this, there actually were plans for a next-gen follow-up where Wei Shen worked with a corrupted partner. You play as both characters, it's set in a fictional megacity set in Pearl River Delta where Hong Kong is. You have the ability to arrest any NPC character, and kind of like the iFruit app in GTA 5, but a lot more dependent and clever, use a phone app to manage police activity in different areas along with all the hacking and scanning based off the original game. Oh, what could have been. Even nearly a decade later, they sound like really creative ideas. And like what Square Enix did with this game, it shouldn't have gone to waste. I swear, United Front Games have had more of their projects cancelled than completed during their nine year existence. Yes, a year later after becoming a support developer for the Tomb Raider reboots and Halo Master Chief Collection, the Vancouver based developer folded, which is pretty sad given the level of talent they showed on display. Although given how often people rave about sleeping dogs now, I I think those sales numbers might have slowly climbed over the last near decade to be considered a sleeper hit, again no pun intended. If that's truly the case, it deserves that recognition. Easily better than both true crime titles in every way, an instant recommendation if you're a sucker for story driven and or open world games, especially if it's on sale on different game stores online all the time, and I believe there's enough of a following now that it deserves a second chance this upcoming generation. I'd buy it if it happens, and I hope everyone else Else who's played Sleeping Dogs feels the same way. Let's get you cleaned up. Yeah. 